real election. Uh, he was going to do big stuff in Vietnam. The military all knew it. The American people didn't know it. They thought Goldwater was a warmonger, but Johnson was, he was already planning big stuff. And uh, uh, without, they were planning it in Washington, but the people in the Pacific didn't have any plans to do this, which uh, was another story that I won't get into. They had to make the plans after the fact and put them in the file to, you know, give the impression that they had plans. But anyway, uh, we have to get our, you know, notified transportation people, get our stuff back that's somewhere heading for Germany. Uh, take out the snow sleds and the winter coats and replace it with some, you know, summer stuff because we're going to Hawaii. But I couldn't find out. They wouldn't tell me anything about what I was going to do. So I assumed I was going to be in the 25th Division that was everybody knew was going to be going to Vietnam, the first division to go to Vietnam because that was their job, 25th Division stationed at, uh, uh, in Hawaii. So, uh, couldn't find out anything, and I get over there, we fly in, and there's a Navy guy, Lieutenant Commander, and his wife meet us at the airport, you know, do the lays and all this stuff this traditional Hawaiian greeting. And Laverne says, what's he going to be doing? <laughs> and he says, flying. <laughs> and she said, that scared her. Because she'd always been afraid that I'd get into flying stuff. And, uh, you know, danger and all that stuff. And I said, flying, what do you, what do you mean flying? Can't tell you. It's all classified. So I had been smuggled in there as as the part of the uh, charter members of the Sink Pack Airborne Command Post, which was an alternative alternative uh, command post in case the Russians uh, knocked out uh, Camp Smith. Uh, because that was before satellite communications. People, a lot of people don't understand, and this is something we can inject here. Before satellite communications, there were no cell phones and, and all that business. The communications between Washington and Saigon, where the war was going on, went by landline to California, undersea cable to Hawaii, and then everything had to be broadcast by radio signals using Air Force communication trailers hopping across the islands all the way to the Philippines and then over to Vietnam. So it was a very complicated thing and everything had to be hard copy printed out and then retransmitted by a human being. At, in Hawaii. So if the Russians had hit us with a nuke and knocked out Camp Smith in Hawaii, uh, the war would have come to an end in Vietnam because there had been no communica way of communicating except by airplane or carrier pigeon uh, between Washington and Vietnam. So they created this airborne command post and we had a me and uh, Lieutenant Colonel, I was a major at the time, uh, had a key and a 38 revolver. And we were the only people with weapons allowed on the plane. We had a key to a lockbox that had the nuclear launch codes for all the nukes from California to India, the whole Pacific command, submarines and everything. 
and in case our headquarters uh, on Oahu was knocked out, then we would assume five, eight guys on an airplane 24 hours a day flying around over the Pacific uh, would uh, assume command and control of the nukes for the whole Pacific and retaliate because we had the the real live codes to launch the uh, nukes to retaliate against uh, anybody that attacked us. So I did that for three years and it was it was interesting. Uh, boring at times but you found things to do. We had exercises and you had to be extremely careful during exercise that you didn't open the wrong envelope. <laughs> and we had a warrant officer and a Navy chief to do that on the ground one time, and I don't know what happened to them, but they were gone the next morning. Uh, so you don't mess with the, that type of stuff if you're in uniform. If you're a politician, that's a different thing, I guess. But anyway, uh, I did that for three years, and it was a frozen assignment. Everybody, all my friends are going to Vietnam, and I'm riding around the airplane with these nuclear launch coats. And uh, I was the logistician on the on the battle staff. But it was it was an extremely interesting assignment because since we we're flying around, going nowhere. Because the Air Force called it being, we were in orbit. We just you know, they'd designate a place and we'd circle around in the sky over the Pacific. And uh, they, uh, uh, we hauled a lot of um, high level passengers, like when uh, General Westmoreland's, who was a commander in Vietnam, as you know. Uh, uh, his family lived in Hawaii for a while, a couple of years while he was commander over there. And when there was a conference or something, like President Johnson is going to have a conference with uh, President of Vietnam and Westmoreland and so on in the Philippines, if he'd come to Hawaii and spend a weekend and take the family back with him. So I'd end up, uh, Mrs. Westmoreland would uh, play bridge with a couple of the NCOs and uh, I'd end up manning the, the uh, communications stuff and babysitting <coughs> their eight, Westmoreland's eight-year-old daughter who was an interesting character. And uh, I won't get into that other than to say that she had met five or six presidents. And she I said, to, are you excited about meeting President Johnson? No, sir. She said, he's always wanting to shake hands. And his hand feels like an old wet fish. I said, who's your favorite president? President Eisenhower, because he used to come to our house for when my father was uh, superintendent of West Point, he'd come eat. He's a nice man. But uh, so we met a lot of interesting people flying around uh, on, on those on that airborne command post. But then uh, I went to Vietnam. And uh, my first. I don't know if we got time. You can cut this out if you don't have time for it. Uh, my first day in Vietnam was uh, first night, I guess, was very eventful. I uh, <laughs> uh, flew from Hawaii, left my family in Hawaii. They stayed there for a year. We've been there three years, so they stayed there for an additional year uh, while I was in Vietnam. And so I leave on a Sunday afternoon, 
and I'm on this plane with a bunch of civilians and people coming back from R&R &R and that kind of thing. And uh, I'm wearing fatigues and you know, so on uh, wings. And there were a couple of helicopter pilots on there that had been on R&R. &R. And we land at Saigon and the, uh, there's a guy walking around with a with a bullhorn, and he's saying, uh, "Just a few minutes, get on the bus. Those of you going to the replacement battalion, uh, we'll uh, we're we're waiting for a for an armed vehicle to come to escort the bus because we we get uh, ambushed frequently on this route. <laughs> we're waiting for." It. Machine gun, uh, somebody with a 50 caliber machine gun uh, to escort the bus up to the replacement battalion from Saigon, from Kimpo or whatever, not Kimpo. But anyway, uh, one of these helicopter pilots come up to me thinking I'm one of them because when they sew on these wings, you can't tell a pilot from a crew member. <laughs> so they were, I was part of the club anyway, the, the, the flyboy club. And they said, hey, you don't want to get on that bus. He said, that's suicide. <laughs> he said, we're going to Kuchi. Got a helicopter coming to pick us up. We'll take you up there and drop you off. So I accepted. So I went on the helicopter and that's when I decided that night, first night, that if I was going to do any travel in Vietnam, it wasn't going to be on the ground. You know, if I could avoid it, I was going to get get in the sky with somebody that had, had guns on their airplane. But anyway, I go up there and they dropped me off at this replacement battalion and there was a sergeant met us and there was nobody around but this sergeant. Everything's dark except for the little twinkling lights here and there. And he says, there's a tent over here. It's got canvas cots that you can stay in that overnight. He said, I understand you got somebody coming to get you tomorrow. Yeah. He says, there's a, it was monsoon season raining. And uh, duck boards, pallets, laying down through the jungle for you to walk on because otherwise you'd just mire up in the mud. And so he says down at the end of this trail of pallets uh, there's a shower down there. If you've seen shower and I was the place was smelly and I was smelly and sweating and I need to shower back. So I had a suitcase, a little suitcase with necessities and underwear and cake of soap and a towel and stuff like that. So I get undressed and give me a towel and a cake of soap and I better take my bill full. And I go down the little trail and I go into this tent and there's this makeshift uh, shower uh, like it had been drove nails in a piece of metal, you know, and put it in the bottom of a bucket type shower. And I could hear a motor running, doing the pump, and uh, pumping the water out of a little creek somewhere nearby. So I get all lathered up, and all heck breaks loose. There are weapons firing everywhere, and the light goes out, the little engine cuts off, and I'm there standing on this pallet in the middle of the jungle <laughs> with nothing but a cake of soap in my hand and a billfold laying over there. And I get to laughing. I, laid, I just laid down on the pallet. What can I do? Nothing. Where can I go? Nowhere. I don't know nothing. I don't know where to go. There's nobody here except people shooting at each other. And <laughs> I get to laughing. You know, you, 
I don't know what type of situations you've been in, but military people can find humor in disaster. That's that's how you survive. And I got to laughing. I thought, and my wife is going to get some kind of a story, and hopefully it's not going to be. We discovered your husband's body laying in the jungle and he was clutching a cake of soap and his bill falling and he was naked. <laughs> Found him naked in the jungle. The first night he's there, and she'd say, Yeah, that's, that's him. That's him. He's, <laughs> he, he, he lasted less than 24 hours. And, in combat, I'm old quartermaster guy. <laughs> but anyway, after a while, the lights came back on, the fire stopped, and uh, a guy named Bill Ellis, who I replaced that I'd worked with and gone to school with, came and got me in a Jeep. And I said, Bill, I don't know what you got planned for me. But we're going by to find an armory, and I'm going to have a long gun. I want me a good carbine. I am not spending a year in this place with that 45 that I can throw and hit something with. <laughs> I am not that not that good long range with a 45. So. That was my first day in in Vietnam. Uh, I ended up uh, being the chief of the I think I think it was a services branch of the deputy chief of staff for logistics in the army headquarters, and uh, it, it was an interesting job. I, I uh, was the president of the menu board that decided what the troops ate over there, ordered the food, uh, oversaw the uh, the uh, requisitioning of all the food that came into the country. Uh, had a major that worked for me that we uh, approved all the uh, stuff that we furnish the Koreans and other allies and secret organizations. And uh, I had the two mortuaries in Saigon I had oversight over. Uh, the petroleum pipelines, uh, I was responsible for them and property disposal. And uh, and offshore procurement, I had to approve every purchase uh, that was made that came from any country other than the United States. And, you know, there's special forces that come up with uh, deals to get to go to Japan on TV. Why, you know? We need to buy some flip flops for the mont yards or something, and then some some senior officer would had a girlfriend over in Saigon and he or in uh, Tokyo and they'd spend half of their Vietnam tour supervising this contract. Well, I got uh, into their uh, business pretty bad because I disapproved a lot of. Purchase stuff, and uh, one of the things I disproved, I'll tell quickly. Uh, somebody got the idea to decorate the uh, general housing, general officers' housing area, which was uh, a bunch of air-conditioned trailers out in the jungle in a in a sandbar. It had been saturated with Agent Orange. There wasn't a living thing out there except these generals. <laughs> Maybe a snake crawled in there occasionally. But uh, 
So nobody would disapprove that thing. I said, $75,000 for shrubs to go up there in that sandbar around those trailers. I am not approving that. And I went to my boss and he says, uh, well, you know, your job, you're responsible. So I end up going all the way to the deputy commander under under Vietnam, well, under uh, Westmoreland at the time, uh, going all the way to him to get approval to disapprove this thing. And so I go in, and I never met the guy, although he was, you know, we were in the same building, and he was theoretically my boss in the chain of command. And he said, what you got? I said, well, some people think that you need some flowers and shrubs and trees in the, up there in that trailer park where the, where the generals live. He said, what? Uh, repeated it, and he says, what do they want that for? And he said, I said, well, I guess they want to think you need some some uh, color in your housing area. And he just kind of frowns at me and says, well, what are you doing coming to me about it? I said, nobody will support me. I want to disprove this thing. And he says, why do you want to disprove it? I said, well, one of these days, General, this war is going to be over. I mean, you're going to be retired, and I don't want to meet you in front of a congressional hearing and some some snotty congressman asking you, why did you spend $75,000 uh, decorating, buying flower bushes for that Sandbar up there where you lived in those air conditioned trailers <laughs> while the troops were out in the field in tents. And I said, I think I have an obligation to protect you from that. He said, Disprove that thing. <laughs>